A very good evening to all of you and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Barbara Smith. Uh, her keynote address is, in, is on using a count of three neonatal morbidities to help select very preterm infants for long-term follow-up. Dr. Barbara uh, Smith is a neonatologist, professor of pediatrics at University of Pennsylvania and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She's a living legend. She changed the way randomized control trials are planned in the, in the world. Her 29-page CV had to be converted into two few slides. She's a neonatologist and clinical epidemiologist with strong commitment to clinical research that improves our collective ability to practice evidence-based neonatology. She's a lead investigator of several large international neonatal randomized controls with clinically important and long-term outcomes. Some of them are trial of endometrial prophylaxis in preterms, caffeine for apnea of prematurity, Canadian oxygen trial, and her academic qualifications are for par excellence. Her number of awards, honors, and scholarships she has received are too many. To recite some of them, she's received the Medical Research Council of Canada Award from Pyro Clinical Teachers Award, Inaugural Award, Clinical Trial of the Year, CAP Trial. Member, she's a member of the, she's received the award of Member of Order of Canada, Highest Canadian Award, and She's received the AAP section of Neonatal Perinatal Medicine William A. Silverman Award. So I invite Dr. Barbara Smith to deliver the keynote address for IAP Neocon and EB Neo. Good evening. I would like to uh, thank the organizers for the honor um, to give the keynote address during this year's Neocon and EB Neo conference. In the next 30 minutes, I will discuss with you how we can use a count of three neonatal morbidities to help us select very low birth weight and very preterm infants for long-term follow-up. I would like to dedicate this address to Dr. Suda Chaudhry, who was and remains a pioneer of neonatal follow-up in this country. Suda understood that follow-up is an obligation for all of us who care for sick and preterm infants. Meticulous collection of outcomes in childhood is not just an academic exercise. It is a necessary prerequisite to improve the quality of our perinatal and neonatal care. Dr. Chaudhry adapted what she learned in the West to the conditions she found when she came back here to India. And uh, she overcame incredible odds in this process. And I don't know if you can see it at the back of the hall, but just this year, she published a 22-year outcome study uh, from the P P Pune low birth weight study. I hope that there are many young pediatricians in this country who will follow her shining example. The birth of a very preterm infant is a harrowing experience for most parents. Suddenly, a future that seemed predictable becomes uncertain. And although many very low birth weight infants grow up to be happy and healthy children, just like these beautiful twins, the odds of an adverse childhood outcome are obviously far greater than in full-term infants. For example, Here are data from the two UK Epicure studies to remind us that um, only four to five of every 10 infants born in this particular set of national cohorts at a gestational age of 24 weeks actually survived. And half of the survivors had moderate to severe disability. Faced with such frightening odds, parents ask agonizing questions such as, Will my baby survive? Will he walk and talk? Will she be able to learn and succeed at school? 
The oracle of the god Apollo in the Greek city of Delphi was the fortune teller of ancient times. People came from all over Europe and Asia Minor to ask questions about their future. Neonatal in intensive care was not yet invented, otherwise I'm certain Apollo's priestess at the temple would have had to field questions from anxious parents about the future of their frail and tiny infants. But as pediatricians and neonatal specialists, we are supposed to be rational users of scientific data and not fortune tellers. So what data do we have available to predict the fairly high risk of disability in very low birth weight infants with reasonable accuracy? Many teams of investigators have shown us over the years, again and again, very consistently, that the prediction of disability is inaccurate at birth and even throughout the first week of life. So simply the fact that a baby was born with a very low birth weight and or very preterm is not really sealing the fate and is not adequate information to predict the likely childhood outcome. The prediction of disability improves throughout the stay in the neonatal intensive care unit and this is because the morbidities that these infants unfortunately and quite regularly acquire during our care, these morbidities are important determinants of long-term outcome. All of us, if we're looking after very small and very immature babies, all of us fear many of these morbidities, but especially brain injury, seen on ultrasound or sometimes on MRI, and here we're talking about bad bleeds, not all bleeds, but bad bleeds or holes and you know, too many empty spaces in the brain. We're talking about severe retinopathy of prematurity, so the type of retinopathy that requires treatment, and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And we worry especially about these three morbidities because over and over again, um, in the literature, they have been identified as important predictors of long-term outcome. Once again, here are data from the Epicure studies to show us um, how frequent um, these three morbidities are in very, very immature babies, in this case 25 weeks gestation or less. Um, and so the black bars here show you the frequency from the original Epicure 1995 cohort and the white bars basically the second study uh, essentially a decade later. In the center you have the, the, the prevalence of BPD defined as it often is as oxygen dependency at a postmenstrual age of 36 weeks. And as in any study, that uh, takes a look at these types of morbidities, bronchopulmonary dysplasia is by far the most common morbidity in these infants, whereas brain injury, shown on the right on your screen as severe abnormalities on, on cranial ultrasound, and treated retinopathy, shown on the left, are less frequent, as they are in all studies, but nevertheless far from rare. Now, each of these individual morbidities we had said we feared because they are predictors of outcome. But equally importantly, we need to understand that each of these predictors are only modest in terms of their predictive power. What I mean by that is that for all three morbidities, each of them, if you have only a single one of them, the majority of the babies who have only BPD, the majority of babies who have only uh, brain injury will actually have a good prognosis. But there is one thing that past research has, f has failed to recognize and to examine properly, and that is that, of course, quite a few babies acquire more than one of these morbidities. And it wasn't clear until we started to look at it in the 
tip study cohort, um, what the impact would be of acquiring two or more of these morbidities. So that's exactly what we set out to do uh, originally with the TIP study cohort from the trial of indomethacin prophylaxis in preterms. Um, and we asked not only what is the prognostic value of the individual morbidity, but how do they work when they coincide in a, in a baby. And just to remind us who these babies were that entered into this analysis, they were all extremely low birth weight, so less than 1,000 grams birth weight. And um, um, there were 910 of these children in this analysis. Now, this paper was published by now quite some years ago. Um, and um, I um, will start here, but we will move a little bit more into the recent literature later on. So here, just to remind us what the frequencies of these morbidities were in the TIP study cohort, just as in Epicure, BPD the most common, followed by brain injury and severe retinopathy of prematurity. The outcome that uh, we were trying to predict in this ancillary analysis was the same outcome that was the primary outcome in the trial, which was um, death or disability uh, at 18 months corrected age, and disability defined as having at least one in, uh, in uh, the following four domains, motor function, cognition, hearing, and vision. The only difference between this analysis and the original trial was that we excluded the children, the babies who had died before a postmenstrual age of 36 weeks. And that was obviously done because those early deaths, those babies who had these early deaths cannot develop the morbidities by definition that we were interested in, including BPD and also severe retinopathy of prematurity. Now this slide is a beginning of showing you the data, and we're here simply looking descriptively at the observed rates that the children had who were lucky enough to leave the neonatal ICU without any of these three morbidities. And you can see that rate is 18%. Obviously not zero, it's never zero, but um, quite a bit lower than we would expect uh, for a cohort of extremely low birth weight infants. And then you see the rates going up for the various situations where you have each of these three morbidities, but only that, uh, you know, without a second or third morbidity added. This slide shows you now the combinations, all possible combinations of these three morbidities. First, you know, various combinations of two, and then in the last row, um, the observed rate of an adverse outcome, late death or disability at 18 months, if you had all three. And I think as you're looking at these rates, you're beginning to see the troubling effect of um, combining morbidities in a single child. Now, our senior statistician at the Neonatal Trials Group in Canada, Professor Robin Roberts, used logistic functional regression to confirm what others had shown before us, that each of these morbidities was significantly associated with the poor 18 months outcome. But that wasn't news. As I said, that was just a confirmation because we had actually picked these three morbidities for our analysis because so many people before us had shown that these are arguably the three most important ones. However, Professor Roberts next observation was truly novel and we believe, and I hope you will agree with me at the end of this talk, um, quite important for us clinicians. And um, that observation is, is, is sort of hinted at here in this table from the original publication and you just focus on the red framed odds ratios because basically as a statistician he observed that these odds ratios for each of the individual morbidities were roughly of similar size. Obviously not identical, but in the big picture, of similar size. 
between 2.4 and 3.7. And the next observation isn't directly shown here, but obviously requires fancy uh, statistics and, and you can read up in the paper, but the next critical observation that he made was that the contribution of each of these three morbidities to the prognosis of the child is independent of the other morbidities. So roughly similar size in terms of the odds ratio and independent prognostic uh, contribution. And that, those, those two observations allowed him to develop a very simple model, namely simply counting the number of morbidities from zero to three that a child developed during the stay in the neonatal ICU. Let me show you again very simply on this slide how well this model performed in the TIP study. In the center, you have the observed rates for a poor 18 months outcome for children who had none of these morbidities, any one, any two of the three, and all three. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the rates that the simple morbidity count model would have predicted. But if you're like me, um, you will perhaps prefer to look at graphs rather than dense tables. And this is why we created this particular figure because I think it helps clinicians and more importantly, I think it helps families. I myself and I know many others have used this uh, in, in discussions with parents if and when appropriate. So here we have uh, the probability of a poor outcome at 18 months plotted along the y-axis and along the x-axis, the number of morbidities from zero to one, sorry, from zero to three. The uh, horizontal line uh, across this plot at about 35% indicates the average rate of a poor outcome in this cohort before you assign the morbidity count. The solid circles show the observed rates of poor outcome at each morbidity count with the 95% confidence interval, and the, the line is, is supposed to indicate the prediction that the simple count of the morbidity model would offer. So our first conclusion this evening is that an extremely low birth weight infants who survive to a postmenstrual age of 36 weeks, a simple count of these three morbidities is a fairly good predictor of outcome at 18 months. Now, what about the added role of infection? All of us here in this room know, and there's no doubt about it, that infections, whether it's culture-proven sepsis or meningitis or necrotizing enterocolitis, will increase the risk of future impairment. So in the same TIP study cohort, we asked the question, should we add infection to the morbidity count model as a fourth morbidity? And the short answer is no. And I'm going to show you in the next slide why not. Here, again in the red frame, you see the additional contribution of different types of infection that I just mentioned, culture-proven sepsis, meningitis, necrotizing enterocolitis, that, that, that these types of infections would make to the morbidity count model. And what I really want you to take away from this uh, table is that the odds ratios, with the exception of meningitis, are much lower. They're basically only half the size of what we saw for BPD and brain injury and, um, and severe retinopathy, with, with meningitis being the exception with an odds ratio of four. But meningitis, at least in this cohort, was so rare, 2%, I believe it was, um, that, that it would really not make a whole lot of sense to add to this model. So we can conclude that Infection is a weaker predictor of poor outcome than BPD, brain injury, and severe retinopathy of prematurity, and that's why we did not add it or propose to add it to the morbidity count model. But make no mistake, neonatal infection increases the risk, albeit somewhat less than the other morbidities of a late death or survival with uh, impairment. And importantly, it also increases early death, which we didn't even analyze uh, 
in this particular study. So there is absolutely no reason to question um, that we should make every possible effort to reduce the risk of infection. And I know you're having a lot of uh, effort devoted to this, um, to this objective in, in this country and in this conference. And of course, the most important measures by far to reduce infection in our babies, uh, in our patients, is meticulous uh, hand hygiene and judicious use of antibiotics. So I've shown you data that we published a decade or more ago, and you wonder why she's standing here and telling us this um, today. But much more recently, we used the cohort that we had assembled for the CAP trial, or the Caffeine for Apnea of Prematurity trial, to validate or to, to try to validate this morbidity count model of the three morbidities in a completely different cohort of very low birth weight infants. And this particular analysis was published fairly recently in the Journal of Pediatrics. Now, um, the CAP trial cohort was a bit different from the TIP study cohort in that the babies were somewhat bigger, they were more mature, and they were also less sick um, than the TIP study babies. So the frequencies of, the, of these morbidities that you're seeing here for this cohort, over 1,500 babies in this particular case contributed to this analysis, are somewhat lower than what I showed you a few moments ago for the TIP study cohort. The outcome was also different uh, in that, first of all, it was at a different age. We used the five-year outcome of the CAP trial babies um, at a corrected age of five years. And again, that outcome in this analysis was the same as it was for the original trial. It was, again, with the exception that we excluded early death before 36 weeks postmenstrual age for the reasons we discussed a while ago. And so it was a late death after 36 weeks postmenstrual age or disability in at least one of six domains. The same domains we had in the TIP study at 18 months, motor function, cognition, hearing and vision, but we had added behavior and also a measure of poor general health to the CAP trial outcome at five years when we designed that phase of the CAP trial follow-up. And this is the graph. Um, that corresponds to the one I showed you for the TIP study cohort for the CAP trial cohort set up exactly the same way as I showed you a moment ago. And I think you can see the, that the relationship between the numbers of morbidities and the increased risk of mostly disability in this case at five years holds up very nicely. I want to say here that you cannot use these graphs to sort of um, generalize the absolute uh, rates or the absolute probabilities to your own patients because that will depend on their baseline risk. So for example, in the TIP study cohort, the average risk um, of a poor outcome was 35%, whereas here at five years for the CAP trial children, it's only 20%. 20%. So the absolute probabilities will change, but the relationship holds up. So a child who leaves the unit without any of the three morbidities has a likelihood of a bad outcome that is only about half of what the average would be for this, uh, for this population. And if you have one morbidity, you double the risk. If you have two, you uh, triple it, basically. If you have all three, as in the TIP study cohort, you really have to be concerned about the prognosis of that child. And this is to show um, that the relationship between the morbidity count and the probability of a poor outcome holds up equally well, it predicts equally well in boys and in girls. So here you have the two curves uh, for boys. At the top, girls below because um, at each and every morbidity count, the absolute risk of girls to have a poor outcome is lower uh, than in boys, whether the morbidity count is zero or three, and that's not really surprising because we know that in unselected 
samples of survivors of neonatal intensive care, girls always develop better than boys. In the CAP trial cohort, we went one step further in this analysis than we had done 15 years ago with the TIP study cohort. We examined, and you can see the details of that in the paper if you're interested, we examined the relationship not only for the composite outcome of disability, but for each of the components that made up um, this composite. And we found that for each of these components, there was a significant relationship between the count and the probability of poor outcome. And I'm going to show you only uh, the data for the two most common impairments here, motor impairment, where you can see that the children who had neither BPD nor severe retinopathy nor brain injury had only a 1% risk of motor impairment at five years, whereas at the other end of the spectrum, if they were unfortunate enough to have all three, they had basically a third um, of a risk. I mean, they had a 32% risk of uh, motor impairment, which is, of course, quite substantial. And a very similar relationship shown here for cognitive impairment. You see really the, uh, the increase in risk as the morbidities pile up. So our third conclusion in th this evening is that in very low birth weight infants, that was the CAP trial cohort, who survived to postmenstrual age of 36 weeks, the same count of the same morbidities, fairly strongly predicts outcome at five years. So in two completely separate cohorts, we have now confirmed, we believe, the validity of this count model. Um, and um, it's uh, important to understand that the addition of each additional morbidity of those three will um, increase the odds of a poor outcome by a constant amount. And this constant amount we call the incremental odds ratio. And in the TIP study, that was 2.9. And you see here the confidence intervals quite tight around that incremental odds ratio. In the CAP trial, <clears throat> this incremental odds ratio was 2.4, again, with very tight confidence intervals. I hope you agree with me that these two odds ratios are remarkably similar if we remind ourselves of the differences between these two uh, analyses. We're looking at different populations of preterm infants. I told you several times the CAPTRA babies were more mature, bigger, healthier than the TIP study patients. We're looking at different uh, frequencies of the morbidities, probably because of the differences in the population. We're looking even at different ages at follow-up, 18 months versus five years, and different definitions and prevalence rates of disability at follow-up. So, how might we use this information that we believe is now validated sufficiently to be useful to all of you? Um, how might we use this for the benefits of our patients? Of course, ideally, and that's how I started with my reference and admiration for Dr. Chowdhury, ideally, we would follow up all of our very preterm and very low birth weight infants. But if your local resources do not permit you to perform this universal follow-up, may I recommend the following. Please ensure that babies who you're discharged from your hospital with two of these three morbidities, or possibly even all three, that they at least deserve and receive close and prolonged uh, follow-up. Um, and also if they show early problems, uh, and if there is availability and access, that they be referred to early intervention programs, which have now been shown in trials and systematic reviews of those trials to be effective and to improve outcome. And with that, I want to uh, close with a round of credit and thanks.
uh, first and foremost to the CAP and TIP children and their families who contributed to these data sets, our neonatal trials group in Canada, uh, and all of our investigators and collaborators who participated in these two trials in North America, Europe, Israel, Australia, New Zealand, and our funding agencies first and foremost because they, they uh, paid the bulk of, of the funding, uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Thank you. <laughs>